Good afternoon. I am delighted to be here. Hope I can remember how to press these buttons. Um, so I'm going to talk to us today um, about patient provider communication, um, particularly around shared decision making. And so um, a lot of my work really has to do with social justice and equity. And so that's the lens through which I'm going to be talking uh, today, thinking about how we can think about what happens in the clinical encounter and between patients and providers um, and uh, think more broadly about social justice issues. My disclaimer is uh, that I'm an internist. So I love kids, but I don't take care of them, except for the two that I'm biologically responsible for. <laughs> And so I'm not a pediatrician, um, but I do study race. Um, and so I'm very thankful to Doug for inviting me to, to join the group. This is my first time here. It's fabulous. I'm just really excited to be here. All right, so the things I'm going to try and cover uh, potentially quickly, because I think the audience probably is very familiar with shared decision making, but I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. So what is shared decision making? Why is it particularly important for chronic diseases? And I studied primarily diabetes, but I'm uh, primarily because it's a social, I consider diabetes diabetes to be a social disease, one that is largely affected by, um, in addition to genetics and biology, social factors. What and how people live and the circumstances in which they live uh, determine health much more so than um, what I am able to do in the, cl in the clinician's office. And so I think that there are a lot of lessons to be learned by thinking about chronic diseases in adults that are applicable to how pediatricians have, have historically thought holistically about the social determinants of health and the trajectory over the life course. Um, uh, more importantly, sort of the meat of what I'm here to talk about is how we engage historically marginalized patient populations in shared decision making. Um, my research tends to focus on African Americans, but um, again, that is an example or a prototype of a socially mar marginalized group. Um, and as marginalized groups go, there are common experiences. And so we have no shortage of isms in this country. Um, and so we can think about um, Many of them, all of them, simultaneously, people who live at the intersections of multiple marginalized identities um, and how that plays out in the clinical encounter. Um, and then can we use shared decision making? Can we use that interpersonal communication that we're trained as, as clinician as a tool to think about one of the ways that we can address health disparities? All right. Uh, so what is shared decision making? So uh, there are lots of different definitions of that. Um, and so I like to use pretty pictures. I could have been a kindergarten teacher. Um, so the next one is just like an image that we're going to see a couple of times. But just uh, to sort of run through the three key domains that I tend to work with, they're uh, information sharing, so a bi-directional exchange of information between patients and their providers, um, deliberation, where we talk about the pros and cons of different treatment options, um, and physicians can, uh, should at that point be making recommendations um, and eliciting patient preferences about um, what things they would like to see happen. Um, and then the last is sort of closing the deal, um, making a decision, and coming up with an implementation plan so that we understand that patients can actually do what we're recommending, uh, that everyone's excited and feels empowered about the plan of care, so there are no surprises at three months, like, oh, you didn't take your medicine. Well, I couldn't have afforded it. Um, and so the, the, all of those things have been thought through um, at the decision-making point um, before the patient leaves the door. Um, so uh, this slide you'll see multiple times, information sharing, deliberation, and decision-making. Um, as clinicians, we're taught to think about the SOAP note, and so this maps on, when I talk to medical students, about the subjective, the assessment, um, and the plan portion of the SOAP note. And so we typically think about um, engaging patients only in the subjective portion, but uh, actually we should be thinking about engaging patients in um, all th in three of those four sections, with the exception of the objective portion of the physical exam and looking at labs in which case I would also argue we should be explaining to patients what we're seeing when we get that objective information as well. Um, all right, when I talk to patients, I do a lot of patient education around diabetes. Um, we don't talk about information sharing, deliberation, and decision making. We talk about the three Ds, so discuss, debate, and decide. Um, and so we tell uh, patients that it's important for you to discuss things with your physician, to have a friendly conversation or debate um, about what the treatment options are, and then to decide on a plan of care that's right, that's right or best for you. So an, um, an easy sort of mnemonic for patients to remember um, to help them feel um, activated and more involved in, in the patient encounter. 
All right, so why is shared decision-making important, particularly for chronic diseases? Um, we could say it's important because important people say it is, <laughs> like, <laughs> like the American Medical Association, um, the, Amer uh, the, Association of American, um, the Association of American Medical College Colleges, the American College of Physicians, um, and the Institute of Medicine, which is now the National Institute of uh, Medicine. So all of these organizations and others have specific policies or statements around shared decision-making for clinicians and patients. Um, the National Academy of Medicine, when they were still officially the IOM, um, has two key uh, reports that really are relevant to shared decision-making. One of them um, was how they defined quality of care, um, and patient-centeredness was one of the key aspects of defining healthcare quality. And if you look at the definition of patient-centeredness, it really is how I would think about defining shared decision-making. So patient-centeredness being um, care that establishes a partnership amongst practitioners, patients, and their families to ensure that decisions respect patients' wants, needs, and preferences. And most importantly, I think, is that patients have the education and support they require to make those decisions and participate in their own care. Frequently, patients are left out of decisions because they don't have those skills or information. And they may say, oh, doctor, I just defer to you. Um, and that's really not good enough. We have not um, done our due diligence in making sure that patients have enough information or equipped uh, sufficiently to be able to then make informed uh, decisions and to be fully participants, uh, full participants in the um, decision-making process. So shared decision making is also core to how we think about managing chronic diseases. So again, I'm an internist. I manage a lot of chronic diseases. I mean, having activated patients is a core part of that. Patients who are able to engage in not only self-care, but engage with their healthcare team when they come into the encounter. Um, and it's been correlated with a, non a number of positive health indicators. So it helps us as clinicians be better uh, diagnosticians uh, to get better informed consent for people like me who think about diabetes and blood pressure and shorter hospitalizations. Um, that's great. I don't want to be sued. <laughs> I like my patients to stay with me and be efficient in the clinic. All of those um, can be improved as well. And we think that uh, the reason that this connection between patients and physicians results in better health are through mechanisms that make sense. Um, things around self-efficacy or confidence, patient satisfaction, adherence, trust, and patient understanding. So um, it just sort of, it's not rocket science, but if people are in a safe environment, um, understand what's happening to them, feel trusting of their physician, um, and have the skills and tools to um, enact plans of care, they're more likely to do it and see better health. And so that's sort of the, the mechanism through which we are thinking that some of this communication can impact people's health. Um, yet uh, there are significant disparities that exist in that. And then more and more as we see health centers and um, physicians moving towards trying to think about becoming patients in medical homes, which for internists is new and sexy, for pediatricians is old hat. You guys have been doing this for years. Um, but trying to think about wraparound services and holistic care, um, having activated patients is, is certainly a key part of that. So how do we, um, we've had lots of conversations today, I wasn't here yesterday, but, I, but my, my assumption based on seeing the titles of the talks was lots of conversations about um, historically marginalized patient populations and health disparities and, and how um, are we going to actually engage these patients um, in the shared decision-making decision process um, and what are some of those barriers and facilitators. So some of them um, are ones that we've already talked about today and that's uh, I think the biggest one is the inherent power imbalance. So for patients and providers there's already um, we have, we're wearing a white coat, we have um, the access to um, treat patients or not um, with a prescription pad or to make the referral. We have on all our clothes. Um, <laughs> Patients are naked in a paper gown, they're confused, they're scared, they're vulnerable, they're sick. Um, so inherently between patients and providers, there's a power imbalance that gets exacerbated when you add in uh, discordance by race and class and other sort of things that have um, power attached to those social identities. And so for many people who have multiple marginalized social identities, that power imbalance becomes too much to overcome within a clinical encounter for people to be able to stand up and have a voice in their say, um, in their healthcare. Um, limited health literacy, um, self-efficacy or confidence, trust, fear, denial, and normative beliefs. These last things are, are all things that patients 
that typically sort of run with people who are sick, but um, are more commonly seen in marginalized populations who have um, typically had, uh, are more likely to have a bad experience with the healthcare system or with just authoritarian pop, uh, figures, um, being rounded up at the border, um, <laughs> having uh, bad experiments on you while in prison or in Tuskegee, or just, you know, the range of things that have happened to um, marginalized populations in this country and elsewhere have created a, a narrative of uh, fear um, and of a lack of confidence in the healthcare system and the people who are supposed to be taking care of us that translates into individual uh, trust with providers as well. And so that baggage is brought to that encounter. Um, and so when we're trying to have people have a can-do spirit, um, we have to understand that there's a lot of baggage that people are trying to overcome in, in having that can-do spirit. Um, but the good news is there are a lot of ways that we can try and overcome that. There are a lot of things that facilitate um, activated patients. Um, and there are things that are relatively easy and free. So um, we can, as clinicians, to actively engage patients and invite them in the count, in, uh, in, in the uh, shared decision-making encounter, the quality of our relationships with patients um, goes a long way. Um, validating people's health concerns, so we don't necessarily have to agree with their health beliefs, but, but uh, using some ter terminology early, earlier, um, at least sort of acknowledging or having respect for that, or at least validating that it's a, it's a real concern, it may not be factually accurate, but at least it makes sense. Um, and I can understand why you would feel that way. And here's maybe some more data to support why that may not be true. Um, being uh, emotionally uh, and cognitively accessible and available in addition to sort of being physically present in the room. So here's a paper that we did about that. These barriers are ones that exist for all patients that may disproportionately exist for people, uh, people from marginalized populations. Um, the, I'm gonna talk a little bit more now just about the psychology of um, identity and social identity and what that means in the clinical encounter. And so all of us are a, a composite of different things of race, ethnicity, sexuality, or sexual orientation, gender, age, socioeconomic status, ability or disability. And um, each of these have um, um, a socially assigned power that comes with that. And so, um, and we're all of these people simultaneously, but sometimes we're more of these people than, than not, depending on the circumstance. And how we view ourselves individually is, in, so there's gonna be a lot of glass in the next two slides. How, how we view ourselves in the mirror that we look at is, is in part shaped by the reflection of what society tells us. And so if our society devalues black men or devalues gay persons or devalues people with disabilities, then that is also gonna be internalized by those people themselves. And so again, as we are looking um, in the larger context of um, who has power or who has perceived power in relationships um, as they come into the clinical setting, um, we need to understand um, that their identities are shaped not just by who they are themselves, um, but how society has shaped how they see themselves. Um, and so people are coming with their baggage to the encounter, as are we as clinicians bringing ours. So there's that. Then there's also, then this little thing in the middle is supposed to be a lens, like eyeglasses. So it's the lens through which people see each other. Um, and these lenses are things like stereotypes, prejudices, implicit bias, and normative beliefs. So people have encounters that are actually happening that are being interpreted through certain kinds of lenses, through racial lenses, through other kinds of experiential lenses. And so what people internalize as having happened to them may or may not bear a strong resemblance to what actually has happened to them. And that's both us as providers as well as patients. And so we have all of these things that are happening in a room that are not being talked about when technically we're talking about you know someone's A1C or we're talking about you know immunizations, but there's all this other sort of things that are bouncing off the walls having to do with people's perceptions of who the other person is and who they are in the room that aren't necessarily being discussed, but may have a, a bigger impact on on the care that's delivered um, and the advice that's taken or not. This is super busy. <laughs> And I blessed the tech guy who, who helped me work on these little uh, arrows because I got all messed up when I, when I sent them over. Um, but this is basically um, 
putting, this, um, putting some of this together. So we have patients and providers. Everyone has a little nucleus or atom thing sort of inside of all their different identities. There's a lens in front of their face through which they're sort of interpreting the other person. In the middle is sort of how we typically think about shared decision making, that it's these three things have been information sharing, deliberation, decision making, and it's through these mechanisms of understanding and satisfaction that we actually see health outcomes. Um, but it's you know these these two people with these interactions, uh, and those blue circles represent sort of layers of the clinic, the community, and society. And so all of these things are taking place um, in the clinical setting, but we have to understand the broader context in which the clinics are located. So all of my life I've done, except for when I was at Stanford, but all of my life I've tra I've trained in very urban, low-income neighborhoods. So I was at Johns Hopkins, super great super poor, um, and so um, the communities in which um, the hospitals are located have a huge impact on what's happening when I'm in the clinic seeing individual patients, and I can't forget that. And so it's important for us to think about the broader social context in which the clinical care is being delivered, as well as the individual context in which people's lived experience is when we're thinking about um, interacting with patients. This is all input together. So, so nothing new, just the individual. Okay, wait, now let's have the pointer. All right, so this is the first person, uh, our individual selves, how we see each other, and then sort of put together a shared decision making all in one place. All right, I think those are my busiest slides. Um, and this is just a paper that um, it says impressed, but it came out this year, 2018, January. Maybe last year. I think it was. I think it was January of this year. Has been a blur. Um, and so then here's this. These three domains again. Um, and we did a study previously that looked at how African Americans sort of are defining shared decision making. And I bring this slide up just to say one thing. Um, when we think about scientists and sociologists and how we think about shared decision making, and I'm working with some bioethicists, including Doug. Um, and I have to say, Doug, I'm working on that paper. <laughs> right now, <laughs> I really was. <laughs> anyway, um, I owe him a paper from a long time ago. Uh, it's not necessarily the same as how people are interpreting uh, shared decision making. And so we talked to people and said, what does this mean to you? And the thing, there are two things that I want to point out. Um, just one, you see that this slide is much busier and more complex than the discuss, debate, decide, the three sort of domains that I had shown previously. Um, but one of the things that um, people had talked about was the adherence, non-adherence thing. And so when we asked them what it means to um, share in the decision-making process, a lot of people were telling us that um, what it meant to them to actively share in a decision could be that they choose not to take their medication. Not that they didn't care about their health, that they wanted to lose their limb to diabetes, but they may or may not have had the enough power and they may not have been able to sort of overcome all of those barriers to be able to talk to the physician and tell them um, about their, the social situations at home that made it impossible for them to afford the medications or the reasons that they didn't want to actually uh, take those medications. So their default or their way of being active was just not to take them, but not necessarily share that with the physician. And so as we are thinking about things like medication non-adherence, we have to sort of interpret those with caution and not necessarily assign um, our value system to um, or our interpretation, subjective assessments of what that means, that people don't care about themselves or their children. Um, and uh, oh, lots of different things I could point out, but just it's complicated. Um, <laughs> and there's a whole paper about that. I think it's, yeah, it's this one if you're interested. So the next, I always will try to like end on a high note if I can. Um, so can we use shared decision making as a tool to try and address health disparities? And so I spent half my time thinking about what drives disparities and the other half trying to figure out how we can engineer solutions to, uh, to address them. Um, and so I'm going to talk a, a little bit just about a part of a larger project that uses shared decision making to try and think about addressing disparities um, on the south side of Chicago. And so this particular part was looking at a combination of diabetes education with shared decision making training um, to uh, improve self-management, so people having more activation within their home, navigating their family, um, as well as shared decision making with um, clinicians and trying to see if that in itself, those two things together, would improve diabetes-related health outcomes. Um, 
this is our, uh, our team, we're, we're called Southside Diabetes Project, officially improving diabetes care and outcomes on the south side of Chicago. Doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're the Southside Diabetes Project and the, these are our social media sites. Um, and so you'll see that the chronic care model that I showed initially is sort of the core of what we do. And we've built sort of our four pillars around that. I'm only going to talk about a portion of what we do for patient activation, and that's our patient classes around shared decision making. But we have sort of a multi-level, um, multi-site um, intervention that we do. Um, and so this is sort of from our website just about the patient empowerment classes. Um, and so we have a 10-week program with culturally tailored diabetes education. Um, and a lot of things around, specifically around shared decision making, um, where again we talk about discuss, debate, decide. We particularly incorporate a lot of things around um, race and uh, race as a social construct and what that means. We use, uh, we've again culturally tailored it, so there's a lot of storytelling and people can get up and testify. We've actually translated the curriculum again specifically for the African American church. Um, we piloted that last summer and we're rolling it out um, to nine churches this summer. Um, and doing a lot of other things that sort of culturally fit the African American um, diet, lifestyle, um, et cetera. Um, we made some games and some videos to make it sort of fit adult learning theory. And I'm going to show you a clip of one of the videos that we use in the class, but then also in other settings outside the class. Hello, Mrs. Robinson. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. And you? I'm well, thanks. How have you been? Well, I've been pretty good. Good, good. Uh, have you noticed anything unusual or different about how you've been feeling? No, everything's about the same. And have you been taking your medication and checking your diet? Well, yes. I, I've been pretty good. I've been eating all my vegetables because I know you said that was important. And I've been taking all my medications too every day. Okay, that's great. That's mm -hmm. really important, Mrs. Robinson. Mm -hmm. now, are you experiencing any fatigue or other symptoms? No, sir. I feel about the same. Well, okay. If everything's the same, let's keep you on your current medication and you can come back and see me in three months. Okay? Okay. But Grandma, did right. you tell him about the sore in your foot? It's just a little sore and I don't think it should be anything to worry about. She has a sore in her foot, Dr. Woods. She says it hurts and she's tired all the time. You have a sore in your foot? Mm hmm Well, have you been wearing proper shoes and checking your feet every day? Yes, I have. Okay, then let's uh, take a look, okay? Well, it's just a little sore, but it don't even hurt that much, but it's on my right foot. Well, I do see some redness and some signs of infection, but I believe that's a result of your diabetic condition. Now, the infection is still in its early stages, but it's important that we address this because some serious problems could occur as a result. Okay, doctor, I understand. There are two ways to handle the problem with your foot. I can give you some antibiotics, which should clear up the problem, or we can have you see a foot specialist. Uh, you know, I think I'm gonna have you see the foot specialist. Whatever you think is best, Dr. Woods. I've got a referral slip for you to see the foot specialist, call his office, make an appointment, and they should take care of you. Oh, I, I, I can't see the foot specialist today? I, I have to make an appointment? Yes, I'm afraid so. But I have to work all week, and I don't think I can take off another day so Mrs. soon. Mrs. Robinson, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but we don't have a podiatrist in this office, so you're going to have to make an appointment to call. Okay. I will call as soon as I get home. Great. Glad to hear that. You know, it's also time for your flu shot, so I'm going to send the nurse in, and she can take care of that for you. Okay, doctor. Thank you. Uh, have a, you have a nice day. You're welcome. Mrs. Robinson? Grandma never made that appointment. So we use that as a way of saying that your doctor can be nice, but still not be engaging you in shared decision making. So we have this whole sort of long video that we use as a patient education tool to sort of th take things that are more abstract and make them more sort of uh, realistic. Um, and so we have a paper. I'm just trying to put references in here. So if you're interested in more information, you can find them. Uh, Here's some methods about the study. We'll just skip over. What was the other guy saying? It was skipping rocks or whatever. Um, <laughs> so, some patient demographics. So we found improvements in diabetes self-management. So people were managing their diabetes better. 
um, improvements in uh, shared decision making, particularly over time. So initially, people felt more confident in their ability to, to make uh, to be involved in shared decision making. And then at three months, when they started going back to see the doctor, we see that they were reporting um, behaviors for, both for themselves and their physicians that had improved as well. And we saw some improvements in health outcomes. And surprisingly, um, one of the biggest signals we saw was in mental health. We didn't specifically actually have any mental health intervention, um, but we saw, um, we're actually having a paper that we're writing up now about some of the mental health measures that we um, found. Um, so in conclusion, we found that sort of culturally tailoring diabetes education with shared decision-making training can sort of improve a lot of these outcomes that we were looking at. Um, and such strategies may um, serve to reduce diabetes disparities among African Americans, particularly if part of a larger sort of multifaceted intervention. Um, I'm going to show you one more quick video. So this I showed you the, was a, a clip from the video that we made for the class using sort of professionals, as you can tell. This was uh, made using my staff. You can immediately tell the difference in quality. <laughs> But we have shown the video at a food pantry, so um, we do just sort of a lot of uh, cross-sector collaborations. Um, and so we're at a food pantry every month, um, and we showed the video just as a way of t talking about that month, shared decision making, and then we talked to some people outside afterwards and asked them what they thought. So uh, this is just a quick clip to sort of get some feedback, show you some of the feedback of how powerful just watching that video without the context of the class or anything else was just seeing that without really any conversation with any um, me stopping the clip and saying this is a teachable moment or let's write down the things that happened good in that encounter, none of that. Anyway, all right. Well, watching the video with the grandmother and not keeping everything secrets here from the doctor, I thought that was bad because I do it. But as of today, I won't do it again because she had that big bruise on her leg and the doctor should have knew about that. And she had a sore on her foot. I don't get all that stuff, but believe me, after watching that video today, I'm going to tell my doctor everything that's going on because I have fatigue and tiredness and I just be worn out. So it helped me a whole lot today. A whole lot. So do you feel like when you go see your doctor now, you have that two-way conversation, or do you feel like you're able to do that? Yeah, but see, my doctor, he's, well, in 10 minutes, I got to, so I'm going to have to let him know, no, I need 12 minutes yeah, or 13. Exactly. I got to explain some things to you from this little movie I watched, and I need to let him know what's going on, because I'm real secretive with my doctor, because, you know, a lot of people you can't trust, yeah. and I'm going to have to gain his trust, and I'm just going to have to open up and let him know about my health, because I don't. Yeah, I, I keep everything to myself. Well, but I mean, it's a big step, you know? Like we said, yeah. we're just talking. It's emotional. <laughs> yeah. Talking about your health, you're talking about you. And if you're not taking care of yourself, then who is going to stand up for you? So That's I think right. it's great. You're on your way to kind of like taking that step. Yeah, I got an appointment next week. <laughs> awesome. All right, so uh, that's it. Just a shout out to my main partner in crime, Dr. Marshall Chen. Tons of people on our team. This list is actually pretty short. We have We work with chefs and personal trainers and the American Diabetes Association and Walgreens, just tons of people. So I can never thank everyone enough. Um, and just a picture of Chicago with our former president when he was a young organizer in the city. All right, so that's it, thank you.